Hello, everyone. I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. Uh, we have a special guest with us today. Can you please introduce yourself? Hello, David. I'm Archbishop Philip Prier. I'm the Anglican Archbishop of Melbourne. And it's good to uh, join you as you're talking from Brisbane. And I want to acknowledge the lands on which we both meet and acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. And I want to sort of go back a little bit. You wrote about the Mitchell River Mission. Can you tell us why you wrote about them and about the mission? Yeah, well, um, uh, I suppose the story goes back to when I was studying at the University of Queensland and doing what was then a Diploma of Education. I'd done a science degree, Bachelor of Applied Science, at what was then QIT, now QUT at Gardens Point. And I had the opportunity of doing a, a, a year program to be qualified as a secondary school teacher. And I became just quite passionate during that time uh, to go and work in a, a remote community. So it, it turned out I went to be appointed to Thursday Island, to the secondary school there in um, Torres Strait. And then at the end of that year, I was married and my wife and I, Joy, had been teaching on Mornington Island. We went down to a place called Kawanyama to start a secondary school. And Kawanyama is a successor to what was the Mitchell River Mission. So from 1977, I've had some contact with, uh, with that place. And then later on, I went back uh, when I was uh, ordained a deacon and served there as a deacon uh, as a priest in the church of Kawanyama. So um, uh, I think the uh, the experience to the people there, I was keen to get lost because uh, in many ways, it still was in my time there, a fairly oral culture. And uh, there were many um, you know, rich, rich accounts of people who'd first... Uh, encountered the effects of colonization there the early days of the mission so i was i did a lot of um, oral history reporting and then um, there's often as there were uh, quite a lot of archives and diaries and other uh, materials from the mission itself so uh, in a way that many people probably don't understand um, far north australia has had the, the longest kind of contact with, um, with people who are outside of Australia, because uh, often we've got a pretty much um, Sydney-centric view, you know, sort of Botany Bay and all that kind of thing. But uh, you go back to the early part, about 1606, when um, the Dutch came and had first contact with people on Western Cape York Peninsula. And because of the, the location, Western Cape York, where Kalniamra uh, is, uh, not far from the coast, um, it, it had uh, a lot of opportunity of contact from this the the Dutch in um, what they were called Batavia, but from what we call Indonesia, uh, traveling there and um, and a lot, lot of contacts. So I think that people in Western Cape York, they they had, they've now had about more than 400 years of, of contact with outsiders, which um, is you know, probably quite quite a long period for people and um, and formed various views. Uh, so I suppose on that, that's that's on the, the interesting kind of side of the, the Aboriginal history and uh, the oral histories that go with that, but then on the the missionary side, the um, there there was a, a man called John Brown Gribble who had been a missionary up on the the Murray River in between Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, he'd been a missionary over in Western Australia on the, the Gascoyne River south of Geraldton, and uh, at each place he'd been, he'd kind of been chased out of there by the pastoralists who thought he was his policies were. Um, uh, to liberating for Aboriginal people and giving them, uh, you know, ideas of equality and uh, all the things that you'd kind of expect. Christians would look at other people and think that these were people made an image and likeness of God. So uh, John Brown Gribble was eager to, in, in one way, get on the other side of the, the frontier and try and contact people who hadn't been overrun by the various, you know, pastoral frontier or the mining frontier or the uh, uh, seafaring frontier. And he went to establish a mission at Yarrabah uh, very late in the, the 19th century. Uh, he, uh, he became ill and his uh, son, Ernest Gribble, um, came and, and took that over. And um, I think that same aspiration. So the, as they looked at Yarrabah, they were getting a lot of the, the people who were coming there had been victims really of um, uh, the pastoral expansion uh, and they wanted to is well, get on the other side of where this were and, and um, try and reach people who hadn't been um, traumatized and affected by the pastoral expansion 
but as well, I think, be something of a barrier to stop that intrusion of the pastoralists into the uh, country of people. Uh, and they, so they went to Kauniama, did a couple of exploration trips there, and they managed to uh, settle the mission in uh, 1905 when it commenced. And it was started by uh, some of the white missionaries, but also the Aboriginal missionaries who came from Yarrabah. So, you know, there was, um, it was from its beginning, a place where Aboriginal Christians were expressing their, uh, both their autonomy and their cooperation and their agency in wanting to be part of this, um, this venture. So, yeah, it was interesting to, um, to follow through the history of that. I went, went up to the end of the mission period when the, the government took over in the, uh, the late 1960s, but um, trying to understand just the mutual self-perception, sometimes the mutual self-understanding uh, and misunderstanding that went on. Uh, and uh, how it was that those places operated. But, um, you know, in many respects, uh, remote um, Aboriginal uh, communities had all of the, all of the tensions of uh, people who were brought, uh, came, and came together and brought together, who had different identities and sometimes, you know, history of each other that ended up in some conflict. Uh, but they also had uh, a very great example of agency of um, Aboriginal leadership because there were often very few outsiders who were the missionaries, between been two or three people sometimes there, working with five or six hundred Aboriginal people. So Aboriginal people had a, a great deal of agency in, in leading most aspects of the life of, the, of the, that gathered settlement, trying to make a way through that in a way that probably um, when government intervention came, a lot more resources came, but then a lot more outsiders came as service providers. So it's been an interesting place to keep a journey uh, over now many years, that place, and we still keep a, quite a lot of contact with uh, people there who we, uh, you know, in kind of an adopted kinship relationship. Thank you for sharing that. Your diocese has a program to stop violence against women. Can you tell us a bit more about that, please? Yeah, we have something called PVAW, the Program for Violence Against Women. And that's, that's been something that uh, we, 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 since its founding, which is now more than 10 years ago, we thought was quite important because um, uh, I, I don't think that the uh, Christian church is uh, wildly different from some of the uh, indicators in the society around it. And I think some research that we did uh, at the national level showed that um, attitudes and incidences of um, intimate partner violence but we're not we're not lower in some cases you know they are, they are higher and worse than the general community so um just the very fact that you know christians will will profess um you know wonderful and and uh, noble uh ideas about um love and kindness the living the experience of it can be different so we recognize that this was important to take a responsibility in the life of our you know, church community and um but it was in some ways a uh, pioneering uh, exercise in these matters in faith communities generally. And so we've had some good encouragement from others. Uh, and some of the work we've done has been exemplar in other faith communities who wanted to address these things because we know that they can be, um, uh, I suppose, you know, a, a lot of things are um, corrupting and um, people who uh, are driven towards violence or um, anger can often use even you know, what can be received as virtuous principles in, uh, in a faith system as uh, things that can, they can use to exploit uh, others or to silence them or to um, let, see, see harm done to them in, in, out of their, their anger and their hostility. So I wanted to really face that question, look at the, the whole uh, the question of being an active bystander and not just letting things go past and how we as a community can be more alert to some of the signs of these things and that's been that's been a, a worthwhile uh, exercise we we continue uh, to do and has had some um, rollout nationally now we've got a, a, a national project approach to prevention of violence against women in the Anglican Church of Australia generally so that's been a it's been the journey of that, and I think it's been a, a worthwhile thing uh, it, it, to the extent that we can to be agents of uh, change in culture on an important area. Absolutely. And going from Australia to overseas, you're part of Anglican Overseas Aid. Can you give us an idea of what that is? 
Well, it's um, it's an overseas aid agency, as the name suggests, and it, it was commenced in the time of my predecessor, Archbishop David Penman, uh, because he'd been uh, a missionary in uh, Pakistan. He was there at the time of the uh, Indian-Pakistan War. He was a missionary in, in Lebanon and Beirut at the time of the Civil War there. So he uh, was very acutely aware from his own personal experience of um, the comparative advantage of our life in Australia. He was a New Zealander from birth, and we could just extend that to New Zealand. As he, he could see that we had many, um, many things that we probably took for granted, and uh, he was very acutely aware of, of the needs internationally. So with some, with some people, there were some pretty humble beginnings, but he started this, um, this, this overseas aid agency, and uh, bit by bit that's continued. And um, it, it's one that runs really on a, uh, a partnership and, and an empowerment model, uh, it's it partners with um, AusAid, the Australian government, and because of that, that AusAid uh, has to be accredited and uh, meet uh, various external requirements. But um, we we use the uh, the opportunities of, of partnership throughout the the Anglican family internationally, and some of that has um, has been very diverse. Some in Africa, some has been in the Middle East, some has been in. Uh, in Melanesia and in uh, communities where there is, uh, once again, a great opportunity of um, transformation for the good if we engage uh, people in uh, their own agency at the local level. And so empowering empowering uh, women's groups in Melanesia has been important because some of these communities have um, very uh, gender stereotyped roles and uh, power imbalance and um, often indicators of some of the things we were spoken about earlier in terms of intimate partner violence. So we've, we've uh, worked through um, our partners, entities like the Mother's Union, which is an Anglican church body, a women's body, to, um, uh, in the early days, uh, do some empowerment to um, roll out the uh, provision of solar lighting, because for many of these remote villages in Melanesia, uh, don't have the access to any um, at that time any any electrical power and that was quite transformational but now increasingly in these these areas about community transformation now there's a book uh, faith in development that makes the argument that faith should be part of development you wrote an endorsement of that book can you explain why you think faith should be part of that because for people watching they might say look don't they just need schools and food and medicine why does faith need to be part of that yeah, well, that was uh, that was actually written by Bob Mitchell, who at the time was the uh, chief executive officer of Anglican Overseas Aid, and uh, uh, that was um, part of his uh, his doctoral uh, writing. And I think he was really really looking at you know well yeah really trying to open that question up. <laughs> Is there anything distinctively that a Christian faith perspective brings to a, a question of overseas development, and I suppose by extension to any other participation we, we uh, the Christian church has in society and I think you know it really does come down to some of these concepts like um, that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God and what does that then imply about how we we look at others and see their rights their potential uh, the things which inhibit them expressing that potential or where their their rights are diminished um, how is it that we look at uh, at, at a world of um, uh, imbalance where, you know, we, we will often in a society like ours become um, irritated, you know, as I say, these are first world problems. People will be, you know, finding something is, is you know, very disagreeable to them, where, whereas other, other people in other contexts might have, you know, not, not even the, the uh, any share of the kind of things about education or, or health or safety or... Um, uh, the, the possibility of improving their their circumstances. So um, I think you know that, that that book was trying to say is there something distinctive that comes from that? No, to, so I can't do justice to it in a, in a few words, but it really was was saying that there is is something there because I think you know if, if it's we can see if if you don't have some sort of guiding principles, it's very easy for especially overseas aid to become purely just for uh, external diplomacy and political uh, kind of positioning. So yeah, you'll give things to 
to people to to gain favor and influence and those things. So it's really saying that there needs to be more than that. There needs to be you know a principle about human uh, the human person human development and what that means and what um, uh, what challenges that does give back to a society like ours where uh, bit by bit we have slipped back in our um, proportion of gross domestic product that we are committing to uh, overseas aid and we have you know in the last probably decade or so we have tied that that aid sometimes to these um, uh, you know more diplomatic kind of uh, purposes so it's a um, it's a big uh, it's a big question I'm glad glad you asked about that that's a, a book worth reading if people can get access to it uh, about faith faith-based development and given the sort of never-ending stories about domestic violence in Australia, the struggles overseas with poverty, and of course poverty here. Do you have hope that we can ever really get on top of these issues? Well, uh, I, I, have, um, I have the hope that the human heart can always be converted to those things that, that build up rather than, than destroy. And uh, but we can see that... Um, the long, the long human history is is one of um, us really struggling to be peace builders. We um, we we seem to be uh, more readily motivated to be uh, to be people who find the find energy in a polarized position or, or in hostility. So uh, I think this you know, this, this might be. Uh, it's something like the original sin that we read about in the in, in the scriptures that there's there's always this um, this opportunity for a glorious future, but there's also almost at the same time we bear the uh, the seeds of uh, quite cruel destruction, and we've all got to manage that. And I, and I you know, think that's uh, that's it. Both um, uh, personal journey. I mean, I think it's the journey of Christian discipleship, but it's also uh, an ecclesial, a gathered, a gathered journey. It's a social journey, and uh, I hope um, that the Christian Church is an articulate voice in moving things towards uh, the kind of personal decisions that are peace building, that are for personal safety. Um, so yeah, I, I think everything's possible. But I think it's not a, it's not as if there is just a utopian switch we can sort of say we, we've just solved it all because we can see how pernicious some of these things are and um, some of the cruel choices that people uh, can make um, that seem appealing to them, but the destruction to others can be uh, quite great. And even if it's not always visible entirely at the time, sometimes it's tragically hidden. Now, faith, of course, is bigger than just one denomination. Can you talk a little bit about the relationships you have with sort of ecumenical groups like the WCC, CCA, and I should mention the World Student Christian Federation because we're affiliated with them. Yeah, thank you. I, I, well, I've had a, what to me has been a very rich and um, productive journey of ecumenism. I've um, attended about four World Council of Churches assemblies. I've been involved in the Christian Conference of Asia, which is a, a regional kind of, um, uh, sister organization with the World Council of Churches. Uh, and I, I've been involved in a, in a number of um international Anglican gatherings and, and other ones. And additionally, I feel very privileged that I chair the Anglican and Roman Catholic uh, International Commission. So we have a, an Anglican co-chair and I own that. And my Catholic co-chair is Archbishop Bernard Longley, the Catholic Bishop of Birmingham in England. And where the, the success of theological dialogue to that was, was first started between the Anglican Church and the, the Roman Catholic Church in the 1960s. So. I think in all, all of those um, all of those opportunities, you really learn that we're uh, as much as we we strive to be whole and complete, and and that's that's the kind of the assertion that Christians make. They are part of a, a holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, but uh, we are always enriched by being in contact with people who have different receptions and different historical receptions, different cultural receptions of Christianity. And interacting with them and seeing what that uh, uh, stimulates us, and, and so in the archic dialogue, we um, we are using uh, a, a technique there called receptive ecumenism. So instead of walking into the dialogue kind of with the confidence, well, I know I know you know what's right, and I'm going to try and tell you where you're wrong. You walk into the dialogue with the sense of well, what does the 
what is the other reception of uh, Christianity? What does that have more developed that we might learn from that's been undeveloped in our tradition? You know, what, what are the places where historical uh, differences can be uh, understood in a, in a, through a different lens and worked out that way? So we're, it's a very, yeah, it's a very rich environment. And I, I think that um, in the Australian context, there's probably, um, as the society changes and becomes more secularized, and I think as uh, different traditions have needed to properly respond to the, um, the, the impact and the, the awful impact of institutional uh, effects of child abuse, that um, people, people still need to be challenged to reach out to others because we've become, the, the tendency is in that environment to become a little bit more insular and looking at uh, internal matters rather than the, the intersecting matters. And to give a better context of the Anglican Church, can you reflect on some of the defining moments in the Anglican Church, say Australia-wide or in, in Melbourne? Yeah, well, I think um, the Ang Anglican Church, as you probably could imagine, uh, well, it, it, it was very much a, a creature of its um, its its era. The the nineteenth century, from early on, the nineteenth century was was one where I suppose Anglicans, uh, because of the growth of um, British colonialism, uh, had at, at the very least um, countrymen who were going to very diverse parts of the world that they hadn't previously been to. So um, uh, the church often wanting to minister to their uh, adherents quickly uh, in, ha had to engage in, in the communities into which those people had gone in that colonial experiment. So um, uh, that's broadly the experience of Anglicanism in Australia. It, it starts with with um, really a, a chaplain to the um, the, the early uh, colonising you know, police and, and and military forces who, who came there to um, to Sydney uh, to to found a penal colony. So you know, bit bit by bit, it, it kind of as the church always is, it's it's communicating the gospel into a, a new generation of people. It's always open to the what are the boundaries of of culture and identity. And I think that um, Anglicans in Australia, like other Christians, um, they uh, they were in in many places, um, a bit like I'm talking about earlier on, um, John Brown Gribble. Uh, they they were the uh, you know, the, the one different voice to all the voice of the, the pastoralists and the, and the people who really just saw Australia as a land to be seized and taken for themselves. And, um, and there were certainly Christian voices. And this is picked up really well in uh, Henry Reynolds' book, This Whispering in Our Hearts, uh, that were, uh, they stood out as, as a, a, different, a different witness to a different kind of a future uh, a claim about the shared humanity that settlers and uh, First Nations people had that was very different to the, to the popular discourse. And um, so I think the Anglican Church has had many of those uh, experiences. Um, it, 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 we, we have gone from being probably the majority uh, of Australians at the time of the First World War. I think over 50% of people were identified as Anglican at the time of the First World War, and that's why many Anglican churches will have very big monuments of the uh, of the on their wall of the people who went to to serve and died in the First World War for King and Country, God, King and Country. Uh, you'll see those things in many places. But bit by bit, um, the uh, you know the, the migration patterns of Australia mean that we, and I suppose the secularisation of um, of our society means that we we are, are not in that dominant position where you know probably in. in Roll fifteen percent in many places. It's not always entirely even, um, but still, where uh, you, you know we are, we we have a a very visible presence. We're present in over two hundred uh, ministries of uh, parish from and community ministry in the Greater Melbourne area. We have schools, some very significant community service welfare agencies, and um, they uh, they have a very strong impact for wood, um, and so Melbourne has um, uh, is a 
probably like most capital cities in Australia, it's a growing city and uh, it's a very diverse city. And we have um, in our church, uh, probably really going back to the time of my predecessor, David Penman, where there was a real commitment towards what he would talk about as multicultural ministry. We have, um, uh, you know, many, many congregations that have a uh, background in languages and cultures other than English. So we have you know, all the Chinese congregations, uh, Karen, people who've come here as refugees from Myanmar, uh, Maori congregation, some uh, ones in different Ind Indian languages, African languages, particularly Sudanese. So, um, you know, it's quite a, quite a broad ensemble of, of communities as well as Iranian uh, new believers to Christianity. We have an Arabic congregation. So, you know, they, they kind of, um, uh, more and more, I, I think we are glad to, to have um, our church looking more like the community we're in rather than like the community that might have been back in, the, in, in a generation two or three behind, uh, even though many of our buildings and the kind of monuments will bear that, that kind of witness of what it was like more than more 100 years ago. Now, pastoral care is a very important part of the church, and your church helps ageing parishioners, visits people in aged care homes, helps seafarers, people in prison. Can you give an overview of pastoral care in Melbourne, how you see it? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a really important observation. Actually, I think that uh, it's one of the I think it's been you know one of the charisms of uh, Anglicanism that we are uh, by our, our longer history communities that are embedded in the local community, and many of our churches will be uh, like that. They will be present in local community, and um, they will aspire to be uh, a living presence and contact within that local community. So. Um, uh, I think that's uh, important. Uh, as uh, institutions have grown, um, you do need more specialised situations of uh, people being involved in some of that. We have good partnership with the, uh, the institutional providers. So uh, prison chaplaincy is one where we, uh, we have strongly shared funding with the state government. Um, sadly, uh, hospital chaplaincy is one that we don't have a lot of uh, shared resource with and we're needing to withdraw some of our, our church resource from that. Uh, and that, that differs around the different states. They have quite different positions as to how they, they see these kind of things. But I think that um, uh, in many of these areas, things are naturally enough are, are more, more specialised and the... Uh, the training, the giftedness of people who, who go in, you know, they, they need more professional skills, but the, uh, the, the outcomes of good pastoral care, I think are quite transformative for many people and many people will, will do attest to that still in our, in our community as, uh, as secular as many of its aspirations are often represented to be. And how do you see the church's role when it comes to those day-to-day -day issues that impact people, not being able to pay the bills, climate change? Do you see a role for the church? Yeah, well, often um, it's through our community service agencies uh, that that we are um, quite significant influences in that. So um, we have a national peak body, you could call it, called uh, Anglicare Australia, and it gathers together, you know, a very large number of the the diocesan-based uh, community service organisations. And so we have some we have uh, one called Anglicare Victoria in uh, the Diocese of Melbourne. Brother of St. Lawrence, we have an aged care provider called Benitas and some other smaller ones, but they, uh, they're quite significant uh, organisations. And so um, they're often uh, at, at that seat of uh, advocacy. Uh, they're consulted by government. They often are helping to frame government initiatives. So I, I think at, at that level, we, we bring really a, a high uh, level analytical uh, and advocacy skills but then at the parish level, often many of our parishes, they, they run food banks, they run op shops, they're, they're, they're doing things that um, uh, are of immediate benefit to people who are doing things tough in their community. So uh, I think you know, between you know, the high level uh, advocacy, uh, it, it does need the complementarity of the grassroots uh, 
for for that whole authenticity to um, to be present. So I think there's a lot that happens there, a lot of it's done quietly, but uh, yeah, the impact of um, of uh, that high level advocacy is often very significant. So Anglicare Australia, for instance, run a uh, a national um, uh, rental affordability survey, and you often hear their CEO Casey Chambers. Uh, being interviewed about those things. So, you know, that they are looked towards as national opinion leaders in, in key areas. And for our final question, if someone comes up to you and says, can you explain Anglicanism to me? What do you say to them? What's your go-to? Yeah, well, I think I think Anglicanism is, uh, you know, it's, it's a heart, of course, it's Christianity. It's, it's a reception of people who uh, believe uh, the claims that the New Testament makes about Jesus. They believe that Jesus is part of um, God's new purpose for uh, humanity and creation. So uh, at, at its heart, we, we need to keep forward that Christian profession of faith. But I think Anglicanism seeks to be um, something which is not just always innovative. It, it, it is uh, part of the reception of the, of the church's teachings throughout a long history where there have been many experiments with theology and different things, and we we seek to hold to those uh, those wise learnings that have come through the, the history of the church and received from the scriptures and the history of the covenant people. So I think, you know, our, our profession, we are a creedal church, to be part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church is important, and we are tend to be uh, local and relational in our in our context as well as uh, international in our connections and ecumenical in our aspirations. Thank you so much for doing this, Archbishop. It's my pleasure. And I hope you um, uh, find some people who um, will be interested to engage in some of these thoughts. And it stimulates uh, the ideas of, uh, of the people in, in your um, student Christian movement community. <laughs>